thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we appreciate everybody's participation. And again, I just want to remind everybody, please keep your microphones and videos turned off. I'm going to turn it over to Peter Ratcliffe from the East Side Freedom Library to, stay, to say a few words. Thank you, Robin. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, joining us on this journey of exploring the making of Minnesota, uh, which the Eastside Freedom Library, the Ramsey County Historical Society, um, and the Roseville Library of the Ramsey County Public Library System have been embarking on in this year, 2022. Um, once or twice a month, we come together and hear from someone who has been doing research, uh, telling stories about different communities who have helped make Minnesota, uh, often these are stories that are not part of the mainstream narrative, and it's an especial treat uh, to get the opportunity to learn about the people who have helped make our state what it is, whether we were aware of that to begin with or not. Um, so please follow this series on the Eastside Freedom Library's website, the Ramsey County Historical Society's website, and our Facebook pages where we make Facebook events to let you know what's coming up. Um, we look forward to your comments and questions. We invite you to use the chat uh, to post comments and questions. And Robin and I will be tracking that and communicating those to Patrice when her presentation is done. Um, or when her presentation is done, we hope uh, we'll go to a more informal format and enable you to reveal your faces and reveal what you're thinking about. So we're delighted to be working with our friends at the Ramsey County Historical Society and the Roseville Library of the Ramsey County Public Library System. And now I'm gonna turn things back to my collaborator, Robin Priestley from the Ramsey County Historical Society. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And again, I want to reiterate, Peters, thank you for all of you for being here tonight. And again, wonderful partnership with the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library going on for quite a number of years now, uh, five or six years, which is fantastic. I want to also thank all of our members and friends and members and friends of the Eastside Freedom Library who are here tonight and all of those members and friends on both organizations support these programs. And there are some great benefits to joining the Ramsey County Historical Society, including our quarterly magazine, Ramsey County History. You can find out more on our website, which is www.rchs.com. And you can check out the eastsidefreedomlibrary.org website as well to find out more about what they're doing and their programs and everything that they're involved in in the Ramsey County and east side of St. Paul community. I also want to invite everybody to come to our May 28th season opening event at our historic site Gibbs Farm, which is up on Larpenter in Cleveland. We're going to be having a book launch for our new historical fiction title for young people, which is called Grasshoppers in My Bed, Lily Bell Gibbs, Minnesota Farm Girl, 1877. It's a really great book with some wonderful illustrations by Terry Swanson and Peggy Stern. And there's even some great recipes in it too, um, which goes back to our program tonight. So um, again, this program will be recorded, will be up on our YouTube channel soon. And as a reminder, just keep your microphones and cameras turned off until, as Peter mentioned, we can have everybody chat together at the end. We have a statement that acknowledges the sacred Dakota land. Minnesota Mekoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges 
facing the Dakota people, just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other indigenous people. You can find our full wind acknowledgement statement on our website. Again, that's www.rchs.com, which includes actionable ways in which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other indigenous peoples of Minnesota and Mekoche, including programs out at Gibbs Farm, Again, we'll be having our season opener on May 28th, and you can find more information on our website on that. So I want to thank Patrice Johnson for being here tonight. She is the author of Land of 10,000 Plates, Stories and Recipes from Minnesota, and Yule, Swedish American Holiday Traditions. Patrice lives in Roseville, Minnesota, and teaches Nordic cooking classes throughout the Twin Cities and beyond. And someday I'm really hoping to take a class with you, Patrice. Um, I want to remind everybody of our partnership with Subtext Books. I will put links in the chat for both of Patrice's titles um, on the Subtext Books website, but check them out and you can get some of our History Revealed titles from them as well as a lot of other books of interest and an independent bookstore in downtown St. Paul. So again, thank you all for being here and I'm going to turn it over to Patrice. Well, thank you so much, Robin. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. I see a lot of familiar faces or names out there, so that's kind of exciting too. I'm going to share my screen in just a moment here. And now this slideshow is uh, sort of random. Uh, so don't worry if uh, you think uh, you're missing here. If you're missing anything, these are just gonna be pictures. Uh, there's no charts, there's no maps. There's nothing you need to be taking notes or uh, worried about homework. So just sit back and hopefully enjoy our chat uh, tonight. I do have a little bit of an agenda. I will start with uh, kind of my personal story about misconceptions I had about what it meant to be Swedish or of Swedishness. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's going on in Sweden now and, and how that affects their food ways. And then we're gonna talk about what I learned in grad school about immigration and Minnesota in particular. And then we're gonna move on to talking about what we're probably all gathered here to really get into, and that's uh, iconic Minnesota, specifically Swedish food, including hot dish. And, uh, and I hope that you all are as excited to talk about these things as I am. Uh, I always like to start with the personal of this story because food is personal. And I think that's what makes it such a great way to tell a story. And for me, uh, my story about where I've come to at this point in my life started, oh gosh, 24, 23 years ago, uh, I was living here in Roseville. And if you're familiar with the Roseville area, we've got a Harmar Mall, uh, which is uh, down the road from where I used to live. And a woman named Sue Zellickson uh, used to have what was called the Cookbook Club. And she would bring in all sorts of folks from all around the country who were writing about food, who were cooking food, uh, who owned restaurants, and they would come and talk to us about either books that they'd written or about trends that were going on in uh, the food uh, business. And if you can remember back to the mid to uh, late 90s, uh, that's when food really took off as a trend. The food network had just uh, started all sorts of magazines where what with food uh, as a topic were super popular uh, chefs were becoming celebrities in our culture food was king and queen back in the mid to late 90s and one of the really exciting things that Sue talked about were new restaurant openings including one in Minneapolis uh, that she was so excited about and she told us this brand new really posh restaurant is opening in the IDS building uh, just a few months this was summer and she said it's uh, run by this really famous Swedish chef and it's just going to be so amazing and you know talking about Swedish food and new Scandinavian food and I thought Who's going to, in Minnesota, who's going to go to a posh restaurant to eat meatballs 
and lefsa and peas, what we have for Christmas every year. There is no way they're going to be able to charge a lot of money for the meal that I eat on Christmas Eve. That just sounds silly. And a famous Swedish chef, really? Well, I had so many misconceptions about what Swedish food was. I also had a lot of misconceptions about what Swedishness was. My uh, ideas and beliefs stem from food that my family ate, of course, you know, at our Yule table, uh, that came from my great grandparents 120 years ago. These foods uh, that we are all so familiar with in our region are lost kind of in this time capsule. The foods, our meatballs, for example, we make them uh, with allspice and uh, tender crumbs and maybe a bit of mustard and some onion. And we fry them and then they're delicate and tiny. And uh, we eat them, you know, with a white sauce or a brown sauce. And that's the quintessential Swedish meatball. Well, when I would speak to my real Swedish friends who actually were raised in Sweden and I'd ask them what their meatball had in it, they'd say, well, I use Italian seasoning and garlic. So things have changed in Sweden. And this gentleman here in the photo you're looking at now is Chef Marcus Samuelson. He's the guy that had the audacity to come to Minneapolis and open a posh Swedish restaurant. Well, the first time I actually had an opportunity to eat at restaurant Aquavit in Minneapolis. Uh, my mind was blown. I went with uh, my best, my best foodie friend, traveling companion, and uh, she had got uh, it was like a two hundred dollar gift certificate from her work at the time, which back then was a lot of money. It's still a lot of money today, but back then in the nineties, that was that was a down payment on a car, and we were you know, single, uh, single girls uh, who didn't make a lot of money. So this was a really big deal. So we got to Aquavit and we decided we're going to spend this $200 and we got uh, the tasting menu. And it was course after course after course. And for the first five courses, we didn't even speak. It was a spiritual uh, experience. It, I call it my epiphany because I understood that Swedish food or Scandinavian food was not the white plate that so many of us uh, believed it was at the time. It was this beautiful balance of color and texture and flavor. Every dish was presented as this art on a plate. And the fellow making this food also didn't look like the white plate I assume Swedes were. He didn't look like me at all. He wasn't pasty and blonde and blue eyed. He had dark skin and dark eyes and dark hair. And he, in fact, was more Swedish than I'll ever be. I didn't know at the time uh, that Sweden, just like America is, is an immigrant nation. And Chef Marcus was born in Ethiopia, but raised by Swedish parents and is now an American. Uh, the face of Sweden is definitely uh, not what I used to think it was. Uh, there's, such, there's a diversity and a balance in the food, in the people, in the region, much as we have here in Minnesota. In fact, uh, cookbook author Helena Henderson, I, I love this quote of hers. She was born and raised in Sweden uh, with a white Swedish mom and a black American dad. And she said she always had sort of this sense of, I don't really look like a lot of these Swedes. Because, you know, 30 years ago, we were just, uh, you know, the immigration was really starting to happen uh, in Sweden. And she said, but when she held summer's first potato, just dug from the ground, or tasted the season's first ripe cloudberry, or smelled grilled salmon fresh off the boat, it did not matter what I looked like. I was Swedish, I was home, and I belonged. And I think we all feel that way about our food ways uh, and the food, especially that we celebrate uh, when, when we're with our, our families and close friends. Well, after this experience with Chef Marcus and Aquavit and learning 
that my misconceptions about Swedishness were completely ridiculous. I decided I needed to do something new with my life. I needed to learn more and uh, do what I was put on this earth to do. And I've always been a storyteller and a writer. So I went back to grad school uh, with this lofty goal of, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make the world uh, a better place. I'm gonna bring peace to the world. I mean, I had all these ambitions, right? And my uh, grad school advisor laughed at me and said, uh, yeah, nobody's uh, got peace uh, to the world yet. And you're certainly not the one who's gonna bring peace to the world. You need to ask a question that no one else can answer. And so I thought about a question that I've had since I was a little kid. And that question goes back to the Yule board, the same one that I had so many misconceptions uh, about Sweden because of. And uh, on our Yule board in my family, the Johnsons, we always had the meatballs that we uh, spoke of earlier. We have always had uh, potatoes with what my grandpa called runny butter or melted butter. We had peas because you had to have a little color. Uh, we had fruit salad and whipped cream, so that was white too. Before my time, they had lutefisk. Uh, there's pickled herring. And we borrowed our Norwegian neighbor's lefse, but we didn't serve it like Norwegians do. We served it Swedish style. So we served our lefse warm with lots of butter and no sugar. And we like our uh, lefse Swedish style like that. But also on that, on that uh, Christmas Eve table was this big, beautiful, hot dish of macaroni and cheese. And it didn't really have any place uh, on a Swedish Yule board, at least for what I knew of Swedish food. And I wondered, how did that macaroni and cheese get there? So I, I thought, well, maybe this is, this is the question I need to explore in my graduate thesis, because through Foodways, uh, we can learn about how culture evolves, because Foodways and culture, they evolve together. And so I determined to find the answer to my question, but also explore Foodways in Minnesota, uh, Minnesota immigrant history, and of course, Swedishness. Well, I started by asking my mom why she thinks my great grandma put the macaroni and cheese on the table 120 years ago or so. And my mom, who had married into the Johnson family, said she thought it was because uh, my grandpa Johnson married a Catholic woman, uh, Grandma Louise. And in 1932, Catholics did not eat meat on Christmas Eve. And great grandma didn't think that uh, German Grandma Louise would necessarily take a liking to Lutefisk. So my mom thought maybe grandma, great grandma put the macaroni and cheese on the table to sort of welcome her new daughter-in-law, give her a protein to eat. And I thought that was great because when you look at foodways and, and how they're negotiated and how they evolve, a religion is definitely one of those. Um, when we have people in our home that, uh, for instance, eat, eat kosher, we want to make sure that we uh, have things properly set for them. Or perhaps uh, we have vegetarians in our family, so we want to make sure that we have food for them uh, that is uh, not meat-based. I also went to my great auntie, who was the lone surviving sibling of grandpa's family. She was the youngest of that family. And she talked about how her mother absolutely adored her brother, Paul. Paul was the, uh, you know, really good looking, kind of naughty guy, the guy you wanted to hang out with, but you wouldn't want him to date your, your friends because he was really a uh, little too much fun. But Paul was so charming that my great grandma let everyone know he was her favorite. And my great grandma was actually um, my great grandfather's second wife. It was very common uh, in the, at the turn of the last century for uh, men in a uh, certain situation in life who probably were middle class or upper middle class, if their first wife died and they were left with children to raise and a house to take care of, they may bring an au pair in to help out in the home, which is what my great grandpa did. He found a Swedish, nice Swedish girl who could speak Swedish and help him raise his, his uh, first family. And lo and behold, he, they fell in love. Well, 
anyway, they did get married and she gave him several more children, including my grandpa and uh, my Auntie Hazel. So Auntie Hazel said she thinks great grandma put that macaroni and cheese on the table because it was Paul's favorite. And in a blended family, you wanted to show that all your children were special, but uh, you didn't have any qualms about showing which one was your favorite. So uh, as I did my research, I talked to a lot of other uh, Swedish uh, folks in Minnesota, or at least people who practice uh, Swedish uh, cooking or celebrated with Swedish food. And I got a lot of really good and interesting stories uh, about where those foods came from, uh, including one uh, from a woman named uh, Carol Jean Anderson, who is actually the Jolly Troll heiress, if any of you remember Jolly Troll. That was a really popular restaurant back in the 60s and 70s here in uh, the Twin Cities. And her family, her parents started that restaurant because they had traveled to Sweden and fell in love with the smorgasbord. A smorgasbord uh, is that one of the very few Swedish words that is so popular that it's actually become part of the English vernacular. And we can talk a little bit about the history of the smorgasbord. It actually started in the early 1700s uh, as something called a brandsvin board, which means burning wine board, or uh, what we might know as schnapps or aquavit. And that was served uh, by uh, the upper class, younger upper class people, new money, uh, when they were having a, a large dinner party. And it was sort of like the appetizer table. And it was generally uh, herring, maybe some cheese, butter, bread, and of course, schnapps and, and or beer. That became known as the SOS table, which is smur oost oxil, that's a butter, cheese, and herring. And we can still see that table when we look at a smorgasbord, it's the very first table that we go to. Um, and they, when, we, when we talk about first table in a smorgasbord, there is an etiquette to eating a smorgasbord. Uh, first table is the herring or SOS table. Then the next table uh, would be the cold table. So that might include some salads. Uh, then we go to the hot table. So maybe meatballs, roasts, potatoes, uh, that sort of thing. And then the uh, next two smorgasbord tables, uh, you may see, you may not, and that would be the cheese table and the dessert table, which would also include coffee. So if you're actually at a real smorgasbord, uh, it's very important that you follow etiquette. You take a plate, go to the first uh, SOS table. I call that the money table because that's got all my favorites. It's got the crab locks, the herring, the eggs, all the good stuff. And then you take that plate to your table, you finish it, and then you move on to the second uh, table and so on. So by the late 1800s, the smorgasbord was really starting to develop into what we know it is today. And a lot of that happened because uh, railway stations were becoming popular forms of travel, uh, but you needed to feed the people along the stops. And at the same time, uh, preservation techniques were becoming uh, really good. And so you were able to not only serve uh, uh, pickled herring, but you might also have some canned food that you could add or salted uh, meats that you could also add to the table. Uh, the smorgasbord kind of fell out of favor around about uh, World War II because it was such an abundance of food. It seemed kind of in poor taste to uh, serve that. Uh, and then it came back again uh, to popularity a few uh, decades after that. And now we see it uh, all over Sweden, usually for fancy feasts. And we saw it here in Minnesota, of course, at Jolly Troll. And Jolly Troll, if you recall, if any of you ever went there, you will recall the mechanical trolls, which is something that, uh, tantalized me as a child. It was such a magical experience to see those trolls and uh, they were doing you know, different tasks 
in different areas. Uh, there were trolls inside the house making porridge and slicing bread. There was a troll outside that was, you know, working in the garden. It was magical. And when I met Carol Jean, uh, the heiress of the Jolly Troll, she uh, told me that the trolls actually were still living with her. She still had about a dozen of them. And she invited me to her home uh, to meet the trolls. And it was one of the more uh, surreal experiences of my life. And it uh, was pretty darn cool. And uh, if you ever get a chance to meet Carol Jean, ask her about the trolls. Uh, for a few years, we worked with Inga Bretson uh, to bring the trolls back to life. Uh, the puppet theater helped repair some of them and give them some cleaner clothes, clean them up a bit. And a couple years in a row, we had uh, close, our troll encounters of the Yule kind, I think it was called. Uh, and it was quite fun. People crowded into Inga Bretson's to tell stories of uh, their jolly troll memories. It was really a neat experience. Another really important topic that we touched on a little bit um, are the Swedish meatballs. And again, I mentioned that my Swedish meatballs are those that have been locked in a time capsule. I'm using a recipe that came uh, on a boat 120 years ago. Uh, meatballs in Sweden have, have changed a little bit. Uh, all of, uh, when we're eating our meatballs, we're sort of paying homage to the past. When real Swedes are there eating their meatballs, they're uh, looking toward the future, perhaps adding some uh, elements to their meatballs that they have found through travel uh, or trend. The original Swedish meatball that did carry that allspice actually dates back to the early 1700s. Uh, king Charles XII was not a very great king he started a war with Russia that pretty much collapsed the entire Swedish army. And as a result, he was exiled to the Ottoman Empire, about where Turkey is now. And it was there that he learned about kafkas, it's the uh, ground lamb and allspice meatballs of the region, and fell in love with them and brought them back to Sweden with him. And even though they're considered a peasant food now, certainly my people were peasants when they brought their recipe with them from Sweden. Back in the 1700s, they were actually a food of only the wealthy, because when you think about how much effort it would take to actually make a meatball at the time, you would have to, first of all, have the ingredients, the fancy spices. Uh, you would have to have enough meat to feed the family and you would have to have a servant to mince that meat in order to make it into a meatball so you can see why that was not food of peasants uh, when it first started uh, but of course it has become very celebrated and immigrants all over minnesota and in fact america really celebrate their scandinavian roots with their family meatball. When I wrote Yule, I have about 12 meatball recipes in there, but when I was actually doing my graduate studies, I studied about 50 different Swedish meatball recipes. So I like to refer to myself as uh, <laughs> a meatball historian. It's the one topic I know a lot about that I love to, to chat about. Uh, one interesting thing too that King Charles XII brought back with him from the Ottoman Empire, he also brought uh, cabbage rolls and coffee. So think about the influences of those three edible items, not only on Sweden today, but on, uh, on America today, especially the Swedish folks who are still making grandma's recipes. I know uh, this is a, fu a fun topic. I've been hearing a lot about it. Uh, dinner versus supper. Somewhere in the last month or two, people have started talking about it again. I kind of wonder if the Star Tribune may have uh, had it in their Minnesota history column, and that started people talking about it again. So dinner versus supper. Uh, Scandinavian and European farmers 
had a habit of eating their main dinner or dish, main meal at lunch for a variety of reasons. Well, they brought that with them when they came to America. And in fact, the main meal was called dinner. Now in Sweden, the main meal is called middag. And I never understood why Swedes were calling what they ate at night middag, which means midday or middle of the day, until I understood that uh, the order of their food was rearranged just like ours. So now both Swedes and Minnesotans might still hear the word supper, uh, but it usually means a light evening meal, snack or soup, uh, or that's what it came to be mean, came to mean. And so when we think about it now, if you come from a farm family in Minnesota, you might say, I'm having dinner at noon and I'm having supper at night. Of course, the word supper comes from the word soup. And it's the same thing in Sweden. So I like to grant both the Swedish and Scandinavian and European farmers for that fun sort of word play that's been getting a lot of press lately. Another thing that's been getting a lot of press lately is cream of lipstick soup. I think one of our uh, outstate politicians said they wanted to make cream of lipstick soup our state soup, uh, which is all sort of based on a humorous Campbell's soup riff. I actually saw it for the first time in Minot, North Dakota at North Coast Fest, which is a big Scandinavian festival up there every fall. Uh, if you look, if you Google it, you can find it. It looks like a Campbell's soup, but the label says cream of lip fish soup. It does not exist there, at least to my knowledge. <laughs> but um, if it did, I'd be willing to try it. I'm actually one of those people that kind of like Lutfisk. Lutfisk, see, I say Lutfisk because I'm Swedish. If you're Norwegian, you say Lutfisk. They like to add uh, vowels to their foods. And it's fell out of favor both uh, in America and in Sweden and Norway, but there's still some communal groups that will come together and partake of Lutefisk. I get it every year from, uh, of course, I haven't, the churches haven't really been selling it in person, which is my favorite part of the Lutefisk ritual is actually eating uh, with strangers and talking about their Lutefisk love. Um, we get it from uh, FICA at American Swedish Institute every year. They do a bang up job. If you ever get a chance to eat Lutefisk, if you've never had it before, I highly recommend eating it at American Swedish Institute. In my book, Yule, I actually included a chapter called All I Ever Needed to Know I Learned from Lutefisk. Uh, and I think people love to tell humorous stories about it because it's uh, one of the few things uh, that people can take from Norwegian and Swedish immigrant culture and uh, really get a kick out of. When we talk about immigrant foodways, uh, it's important, I think, to understand how food is used uh, both as a way to welcome in a new culture or to exclude them. Uh, in the past, uh, new immigrants uh, who were eating food that the mainstream, I hate that word, but for lack of a better one, mainstream, uh, typically white culture uh, would find offensive because it was a, a smell that was new to them or uh, an ingredient that they found repulsive. Uh, it, it still goes on, but I think perhaps it's changing a little bit with globalization and travel. Uh, we are understanding that, again, diversity is strength. And the more we know about one another, the more we can eat one another's food, uh, the more we'll understand one another and get along. One of the kind of sad stories that uh, I learned uh, when I was doing my graduate study and I included it in Yule because it just uh, was a very special interview I had with a friend's mother, her name was Charlotte. She was raised by a Norwegian mom and a Swedish dad in Camden. 
uh, in the 20s and 30s. And in Camden at the time, the smart kids were sent to North uh, High School. And at the time, North High School uh, was also uh, populated by a lot of the Jewish community. And so Charlotte went to, Lutheran Charlotte went to school with a lot of Jewish classmates. And Charlotte's father was well known throughout the community for his butcher shop. He had an amazing butcher shop. And in fact, his Swedish sausage, uh, he was smart enough to understand that if he called it Christmas sausage, more than just Swedes would buy it. And so, in fact, he did change the name to Christmas Sausage, and it uh, was quite popular throughout not just the Scandinavian community, but uh, anyone who liked a good sausage uh, in the Minneapolis area. Well, Charlotte used to bring her father's deli sandwiches, deli meat sandwiches to school, and the Jewish boy, she told me, would always say, oh, your father's meat's the best. So they started trading sandwiches. Her father did not use garlic in his deli meat and the kosher meat had garlic in it. And one uh, evening after school, he smelled it on her breath, uh, the garlic on her breath and became very angry that she was fraternizing with the Jewish uh, classmates. And she, when Charlotte told me this story, you could still see the pain in her eyes. That, this was something that had, was, was deeply hurtful to her. Um, and I think it really, it changed who she was as a person from there on out where she was really interested to learn about other cultures and interested to learn about who they were uh, through their food and through their friendships. So immigration is not always easy and we need to remember the stories of how hard it is so that we can welcome, welcome others who uh, might not be identical to us. Another story I, I gathered during my graduate studies uh, <laughs> also made it into Yule because it just is such an entertaining story. There is a small Swedish pancake, it's called a platter, and it's typically served for dessert rather than for breakfast. And it was pretty popular. Uh, it is actually, in, in fact, popular with the Thursday night soup. It's a yellow pea soup. And then you eat this platter, a small pancake for dessert afterwards. It's a national dish in Sweden and it's also very popular uh, or was very popular among immigrant groups in the uh, 1900s. Well, Cindy talked of her father, her grandfather actually worked at the Moline Foundry and made a platter pan uh, for a lot of members of the family. And uh, Cindy invited me to her house to go over some of these items she had, uh, Swedish baking items, uh, Swedish cookbooks, all sorts of treasures. And she also had a treasure I was really excited about. And that was um, a, a cookbook from the 40s that was from my great uncle's church. In Minneapolis, it was a, it was her family's cooking Bible. She said, and I was really excited to see it because my auntie didn't recall uh, ever having seen it. So it was really exciting for me to sort of to get to touch that part of my family's personal history. So we were looking at this cookbook together, and as Cindy's turning the pages, she stops and says, "Oh, I was just thinking about this." There on one of the uh, clear pages was taped from a newspaper a uh, recipe for Swedish pancakes or platter. And she said, this recipe, you'll not believe the story. It was my dad's job to make us Swedish pancakes every Saturday morning. And this was his prize recipe. He clipped it from the paper years ago and he used it every Saturday. He kept it in his wallet. It was so dear to him. And we laughed about that. I mean, wouldn't he have memorized it if we made it every week? And she said, the reason it's taped in this book in our, our family's cooking Bible is because he had had it in his wallet and he was working at a liquor store and uh, Cindy's dad's liquor store got held up one night and her dad said, you know, you can have my ID, you can have my money, my wallet, but just 
don't take my Swedish pancake recipe. And of course, the, the robber laughed and took everything and laughed. And when the police came, Cindy's dad was like, oh, my, I don't care if you, if you find the money or the ID. I don't care about that. I need that recipe. Well, a few months later, the police called him and wouldn't you know, they found the recipe. So after that, Cindy's mom taped the recipe to the cookbook. And she still has it to this day. And the funny thing about that church cookbook is that a couple of years later, when my Aunt Hazel finally passed, I was going through her kitchen, uh, helping to clean up some of her things, and I found her cookbook drawer. And there, at the very bottom of the cookbook drawer, was Auntie's copy of tested recipes from the Swedish Tabernacle Church that my great uncle was pastor of. So now I own it, and it is one of my most beloved and cherished possessions. Aunt Hazel, uh, <laughs> yeah, she was she was pretty neat. She uh, she was a very spunky lady, and had a lot of friends. It was really hard to ever get a date with her. And when I first started into getting getting to know her a little bit, and I was asking her about our family's Swedish traditions, and and I asked her, I was at the time, I was just starting to learn uh, the Swedish language. And I asked her if she knew Swedish. And she said, no, 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 I don't know any Swedish. And so one Christmas, I was like, well, Auntie, I'm going to come celebrate early Christmas with you. Anything you want, I will bring for lunch. I will bring meatballs. I'll bring steak. I'll bring lobster, anything. You just name it. And she said, well, you know. I think those McDonald's hamburgers are pretty good. So I stopped at the McDonald's, uh, the one uh, right off of 35W, off of Stinson. I got a couple of quarter pounders with cheese and some French fries. I showed up at Auntie's house and she had all of her beautiful stemware and her, her Christmas china and everything was just beautifully set and presented. And we sat down and put our, 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 our burgers, our quarter pounders, on this beautiful uh, china and she clapped her hands together and she said, would you like a glass of wine? And I said, I'd love a glass of wine, Auntie. So she pulled out, now Auntie was a very elegant lady. She pulled out a jug of Chablis from the fridge and poured us each a glass. And that was the year I learned that cheap chilled Chablis is a perfect pairing with McDonald's food. Now, I promised we'd talk a little bit about the hot dish and how it is tied to Swedishness. So back in 2016, food and wine claimed that hot dish was first coined in 1930 in the Mankato, Minnesota Grace Lutheran Ladies and Aid Cookbook. And that is a very, or was a very Swedish church. And uh, Food and Wine said that Mrs. C.W. Anderson was in fact the first person to uh, ever uh, coin the word hot dish for what she described as um, hamburger, macaroni, and canned peas. Well, I don't know that any scholar uh, worth their uh, research would be able to agree that absolutely Mrs. C.W. Anderson was the original person to coin the term hot dish uh, because we just don't know. But it's kind of fun to think about. And I like to like, I like to think of Mrs. C.W. Anderson uh, as having been the first hot disher because she's Swedish and then we could claim that too. <laughs> but Hot dish, uh, for those of you who don't know this, is actually a very Minnesota term. Uh, nobody else uses it except for a couple of the folks maybe uh, in neighboring Dakota right across the border might use hot dish. Everybody else uses the word casserole. I don't use the word casserole because uh, that's actually a dish it's baked in. Hot dish is the term for the food that's in the dish. I like uh, how hot dish is so truly iconically Minnesotan because 
it not only represents Minnesota culture, but any culture you bring to the table. Uh, when I was writing uh, 10,000 Plates, I spoke with Chef Yu Vang. Uh, you are likely familiar with them. He appears uh, on his own show on TPT, and he's uh, been all around our state and the country, in fact, talking about Hmong food and Hmong culture. And he loved hot dish because of how he could represent both of his cultures in it, both his Minnesota culture and his Hmong culture, just by using ingredients uh, that were important to uh, Hmong culture. And after I spoke with, or actually maybe it was before I spoke with you, yeah, the same year anyway, um, I was invited to DC to be a judge in the uh, Minnesota Congressional Delegates Hot Dish Competition. Uh, that was the uh, competition started by Al Franken back in the day, and then uh, Tina Smith took it over. And uh, all 10 of our congressional delegates compete to make the best hot dish. And the year I judged, I was really excited that the three winners were all hot dishes that represented new immigrant cultures. Uh, the winner uh, was a Hmong inspired hot dish. The second place was an Indian inspired hot dish. And that's actually what you're seeing right now. Well, that was good timing. And then third place uh, was a Nigerian inspired hot dish. And I thought, wow, that is, that is immigration in Minnesota. I'm working in tandem because as I said before, food and culture evolve together. And our food is influenced uh, certainly by the past. Uh, it's also influenced by our neighbors, wealth, health, trends, travel, uh, economy. They're everything uh, that influences our life, influences what we put on the table. Now, I mentioned uh, earlier about the mac and cheese on my family's table and how I really wanted to do, to find out, to research. Uh, why did my family put mac and cheese on the table uh, when it wasn't necessarily a Swedish food? And so after I had those two narratives, uh, the one uh, about religion, you know, my did my great grandma put the hot dish on the table to welcome her Catholic daughter-in-law? And the other a narrative about blended families, did my great grandma put the hot dish on the table to proclaim uh, favoritism of a beloved a child? As I was doing that research, uh, a friend and fellow classmate presented another narrative possibility. And she, we uh, talk a lot about American food is very regionally based. We don't have a necessarily an American food that spans states. Uh, we might have, uh, hot dogs and apple pie, but even those come from Europe. Uh, we have pasties, which are from up north in the UP. We have Cincinnati chili, but that's from Cincinnati. Uh, we have an entire California cuisine uh, created by their climate and trends. So there are very few foods that cross regions in America with the exception of macaroni and cheese, uh, which is uh, celebrated among all regions, all cultures. It's a quintessential American dish. So my friend suggested uh, that perhaps my great grandma put the macaroni and cheese on her Swedish Yule board to demonstrate not only uh, was she Swedish and her family was Swedish, but they were also American. And truly that is the story of immigration uh, that, that we adapt and adopt. And still, because we're an immigrant nation, whenever we put those old kind of sacred foods on the table, we're honoring the past. We're honoring those who brought us here. And when we put new foods on the table, 
we're looking toward the future. We're honoring uh, where we're going to go and the people that are helping us to get there. Now, I do have uh, other, I call them the, the honorary uh, list of topics, and perhaps we can talk about them if you all have questions uh, after this presentation. And those topics include some of my favorites, Aquavit, St. Lucia, rye bread, crayfish, uh, Midsummer, uh, also Svenskanner's dog, which is now known as Scandinavian uh, Summerfest and then any other questions that you all would like to talk about. So if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat. And if Patrice can't see that, then Peter and I will read those out. But before we get there, why don't you talk a little bit about one of those topics, the rye bread or some other? You bet. Uh, Let's, let's start with aquavit. <laughs> it's almost happy hour here, right? Uh, I didn't grow up with aquavit. The first time I had it, it was the, the Lini, which is the Norwegian aquavit. Uh, but then uh, an awesome guy by the name of uh, Mike McCarran uh, introduced me to uh, Gamla Ode, his aquavit. He was one of the very first uh, distillers making aquavit in our area. He actually made it a uh, beginning in uh, Wisconsin because of our tax uh, issues and distilling, or not tax issues, but distilling issues here in Minnesota before they opened it up. And he makes a Danish aquavit. And he taught me that, uh, think of aquavit as gin. So gin is like that clear spirit that's uh, uh, kissed with juniper and then uh, other lovely essences. Well, the same is true for aquavit, although its main uh, flavor would be caraway and often dill. And then whatever other kind of mix of flavors the distiller wants to put into it. And uh, to this day, aquavit, because of Mike's influence, aquavit has become a, a staple in our house. We absolutely love aquavit. Oh, and there's one other thing that we didn't uh, talk about that I do want to uh, hopefully help you to understand because I know there is often uh, confusion about uh, using the word Nordic versus using the word Scandinavian. So when I talk about Scandinavian, I'm actually talking about a culture that shares a language and that culture would be uh, Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. And some might argue some of the Swedish speaking part of Finland. Now, the other countries in that region are Nordic. So those three countries, Finland, Iceland, and of course, the islands, those are all Nordic region. So when you hear those terms, uh, hopefully that will help you sort of figure out uh, what people are talking about and why they're using the word Nordic versus Scandinavian. So that goes back to a question, Patrice, and we have some other questions that we'll get to. Um, but there was a question from Krista about the classic Minnesota question, Johnson. Um, is there a difference between the O-N and the E-N um, and the spelling patterns for the different Scandinavian versus Nordic, Sweden, Norway, or Denmark was her question. That is a great question and one I'll probably uh, not answer correctly. <laughs> I know O-N is common uh, for Swedes. And my family's original name was Johansson. So if you don't know any Johanssons in Iowa, they might be my relatives. Uh, but he, my, my grandfather, great-grandfather changed his name to Johnson O. And my great uncle kept Johansson O. Uh, let's see, Denmark, I believe they're E-N. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is there somebody out there who's better at Swedish than I am? Or better at Scandinavian? Um, and then I believe Norwegians like the ENs. And it's simply a matter, again, of like the dialect. It's all, it all means the same thing. It still means sun. It's just spelled a little differently, just like Lutfisk. So you can put that in the chat if you have any insight on that. Um, 
Thanks, Patrice. Uh, there was a question. Um, let me go back to it. Oh, yes. Um, do you want a little talk a little bit about the herbs? Uh, there was a question about what is the preferred herb of the Swedish people? So everybody has their own <laughs> opinions on what herbs should go in what, but. You know, when we look at herbs and even possibly more importantly, spices that are kind of indicative of Swedish, uh, I would say Scandinavian foods. Uh, we're looking at, if they're indigenous herbs, we're looking at the light, cool herbs uh, that grow in cool weather, just like here in Minnesota. So we're looking at dill and parsley. Uh, early on, uh, even pre-Vikings, uh, kale, uh, as well as those herbs, uh, and uh, like a garlic scape, those were very important parts of uh, a Nordic diet because they grew well and grew in uh, not only uh, the climate, but in the soil conditions that they had. Uh, spices, I think, are fascinating because we think of uh, Scandinavian spices, uh, well, actually, of Nordic spices as well. Uh, we're looking at cardamom and fennel. Well, actually, fennel is indigenous. Uh, uh, allspice, uh, clove, ginger, almond, citrus, and not a lot of those spices grow in the Nordic region. But we have to remember that the folks who lived in the Nordic region, even pre-Vikings, were already traveling, uh, taking, taking the spice route and, and figuring out how to bring some of those uh, flavors to the region. Uh, it not only helped uh, make food taste better, but it also helps in some of the preservation. And preservation is another really important thing that our uh, immigrants brought with them from uh, Sweden and really all the Nordic countries, because when they came to Minnesota, for example, uh, we had very similar region, very similar climate to what they were leaving in Sweden. We had grasslands for uh, cattle to graze and for dairy land. Uh, we had uh, game and fish, which is a really important part of uh, the Swedish diet. Uh, we had lots of lakes. Sweden is surrounded by water and has lots of lakes and rivers and streams. We had berries and mushrooms. Uh, we could grow rye and oats, which are, and barley, which are really important uh, ingredients in Swedish cuisine. And then taking those ingredients and learning how to preserve them. So we had them for the long winter and a short, short summer was a really important ability to have when coming to Minnesota, which they brought with them from Sweden. So pickling, smoking, drying, pickling, all of those techniques are so important, uh, uh, not only to uh, old time Swedes, but still to this day in Minnesota, we really embrace those techniques, in my opinion. So a little bit opposite of those wintertime foods, there was a question about um, if you can talk a little bit about Midsummer and the festival and what foods Yay! might be associated with that. Yeah, Midsummer, it's only a few weeks away. It's the most important holiday of the Swedish calendar. It's even more important than Christmas, believe it or not, Midsummer is a celebration that life's renewal. Uh, if you are able to uh, check it out, if you're in the Twin Cities, definitely go to American Swedish Institute's uh, website. Uh, we are, they are taking reservations for time slots for midsummer. Um, we're also, I'm also teaching actually a midsummer uh, cooking class, uh, June 10th, I believe, through ASI. Uh, midsummer, uh, the, some of the most important parts, foods that we eat during midsummer, are celebrate the foods that are were just started. The first foods that we harvest uh, for the for in spring and early summer. So that might include strawberries uh, and new potatoes. Of course, dill. The aforementioned dill. Uh, we also will have a gravlax, which is a cured salmon, um, usually on a rye bread or kanaka bread, which is again a preserved crackers or preservation or preserved bread. Um, herring is a big deal 
at pretty much any Swedish party, but especially midsummer. And if you are a true good Swede, you will serve your hair in at least three different ways. And uh, it's lovely. I also like to add, uh, I like to add a chicken meatball just because it's kind of a lighter meatball. And uh, the people I usually celebrate midsummer with I don't necessarily eat meat. I've also got a recipe for vegan meatballs. They're, some, they're one of my favorite recipes. So if you have folks in your life who don't eat meat, uh, they're really good. And even if you like meat, you'll like these vegan Swedish meatballs. Uh, and butter, butter is really important on the Miss Hummer table as well. Uh, we like to have a cream cake that's uh, got uh, strawberries filled in with it, um, or even just a big bowl of strawberries with cream is a lovely way to celebrate midsummer. We also like to drink our aquavit. Uh, if you uh, are invited to a midsummer party, you will be singing lots of drinking songs. You'll also be singing about little uh, frogs uh, with no ears and no tail, and you will dance around the mid pole well into the night. Music is a really important part of Swedish immigrant culture that I think you can really see. If you go to any of uh, colleges that are either Lutheran or Lutheran, Lutheran, of course, but either Swedish or Norwegian in founding, you will see a choral tradition there that comes from uh, from Swedish and Norwegian uh, music loving. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, that was a great, that was a great question and a great answer. Um, I'm going to come back to the rye bread and the lingonberry one, but um, there was a, there was a comment about in Door County, Al Johnson's restaurant uh, with its Swedish cuisine, and I have been there. And then um, there's also the Sequist Orchard, and they have a Swedish bakery, which I haven't been to. And um, Carlin says that they serve a Swedish standard cookie that she found really unique and delicious and was wondering if you'd ever heard of or had a recipe or tasted the Swedish standard cookie. That is fascinating. And now I'm going to be searching madly for what is a Swedish standard cookie. I wonder, uh, Carolyn, can you tell us what flavors were in that cookie? Because I've never heard of it. And by the way, my grandpa's name was Al Johnson. So the first time I went to Al Johnson, I was like, Grandpa didn't tell me he owned goats in a restaurant. Yeah, exactly. The goats on the on the roof. Can you hear me okay? I no. can hear yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. I, I guess we can't use our 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 videos yet, right? Our cameras, but anyway, yeah, this Swedish standard cookie. I have been my daughter and I tasted it and we could not for the life of us figure out where that recipe could have come from. Because of course we're familiar with the the Swedish um, sugar cookie, it's a type of sugar cookie, but it wasn't the, the sour cream sugar cookie. It, it seemed as if it had some kind of a, um, oh, just a leavening agent that just made it extremely light, but it was thick. They were, they were rolled out and they were probably about half an inch thick. We thought it would be a shortbread, but it was not a shortbread. It, it, was very different um so okay that actually sounds like one of my favorite cookies um a drum or a, a, a coconut dream uh is made with ammonia ammonia yes, uh, uh, yes. Oh, the ammonia actually, have some from a class i taught last week yeah yep I wonder, was it a coconut cookie or did it have a different flavor? It didn't have coconut, but was, as I've been going through all my Swedish recipe books and stuff, I've come across this ammonia leavening agent. And yep. I think yep. that probably has it in it. Next time yep. I go up there um, to Door County in Wisconsin, I'm going to actually beg the, the baker for the recipe. <laughs> well, and in the meantime, uh, if you, uh, if you want, the, if you like coconut, my, the coconut dream recipe that uses that ammonia, I want to say bicarbonate, but that's not it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's like a bicarbonate. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it is phenomenal. We actually taught it in our cookie class last week and people loved it because uh, it's smelling salt. So, I mean, when you first open it, you're like, whoa, blown away because it's so ammonia-y. Uh -huh. But then you add it to whatever you're baking and it goes away and leaves in its place 
a, a crunchy yet tender chew that well, you that, cannot yeah. achieve with a baking powder. Okay, that must be it. And what was the name of your recipe? It's a coconut drummer. Yeah, a dream, coconut dream. And okay. you can, if you, you can find it, um, it's in Yule, in my okay. book Yule, but it's also online. If you go to calledtothetable.blogspot.com. I think I just did a column last week on it. Okay, or great. This week. Yeah. Thank you so much. A oh, great question. Thank you, Carlin. Um, so there was a question about lingonberries, um, why they are only available from Thanksgiving to January, so that might go back to how they are <laughs> grown. And um, then we can talk a little bit about bread. Wonderful. Okay, lingonberries. Uh, do, I, do I actually admit this? You all know the county I live in. We're growing them in our backyard. <laughs> lingonberries are a really important part of Swedish cuisine. Uh, you'll see um, meats are typically served with fruit uh, or berries. I don't know that that is a tradition that necessarily came to <clears throat> America a hundred and some years ago. I think uh, it would became more common in the last 50 years or so. Uh, I buy fresh or frozen lingonberries uh, very uh, carefully. They, uh, if you buy them and they're not grown either in uh, the Pacific Northwest or in a Nordic country, they might be coming from, uh, for instance, China and they're not actually lingonberries. So you need to be very careful about where you're getting your berries and make sure that you're getting a true lingonberry. Uh, <clears throat> they're a very delicate, lovely berry. You can always find them already preserved. Uh, uh, you can get them uh, certainly at Ikea, but I would say if you want a really quality lingonberry preserve, uh, every grocery store in the area from Kowalski's to Cubs to Byerly's, uh, even Whole Foods, carry uh, a lot of different brands. L. Johnson's actually came out with a brand I'm pretty tickled with. I also like the brand Felix. That's a really good uh, uh, brand of already preserved uh, lingonberries. I know a local Finnish woman, I'll not say her name because you all probably know who she is, who buys several, many, many, many like 10 pounds or more of lingonberries every year for her own personal use. And unfortunately, uh, I have not risen uh, to the level of friendship that allows her to give me any of her precious stash. I'm working on it though. <laughs> they are wonderful. I love lingonberries and we all do, I think. Um, and if you go to some of the uh, uh, dinners, they'll have, sometimes if you're lucky, you can get lingonberries around Christmas time. Um, so there was a question from Debbie uh, that her grandma baked for pumpernickel that, that they thought was a Swedish version of it, um, but that you talked about rye bread. So if you want to make a distinction between the two and talk a little bit more about the breads. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, pumpernickel, I believe, is German. I think there's a great crossover uh, between what's put into it. Uh, Swedish rye bread, uh, not to be confused with a Danish style uh, or even a Finnish style. Uh, Swedish uh, rye bread, uh, often you'll hear of a type uh, referred to as limpa, which actually means loaf. So if we say Swedish limpa loaf, we're saying loaf loaf. And funny tidbit on that, uh, kind of related, uh, they actually, you know how we have banana seed bikes or used to, if you're a Gen Xer, you remember the banana seed bikes? They actually have limpa seat bikes in Sweden. Funny, so loaf shaped bicycle seats. Anyway, uh, I think uh, limpa is uh, typically a little bit sweeter. Uh, there's usually a caraway uh, possibly some uh, citrus in it. Really, the, the recipes really vary according to 
where you fall on the map. Uh, cohort of mine, uh, Richard Telstrom in, is a Swedish academic actually in Stockholm. He created something called the Rye Bread Map. I believe you can find it on Wikipedia. If you are at all interested in Swedish rye bread, I urge you to go check that out, the rye bread map, Richard Telstrom. Uh, and also, if you read his intro, Richard's intro in uh, Magnus Nielsen's uh, Nordic cookbook. So the first big, it's right here. <laughs> It's 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 my Bible, my cooking Bible. Um, there is some really interesting stuff about um, different regions in Sweden and how and why their breads vary, not only in whether or not they use barley or rye or oats, but how they actually make the bread. So, for instance, if you live where you don't have ag or it lived in the past where you didn't have access to an oven you might have a community oven and so once or twice a year the entire community would get together and bake bread but they would need to bake bread that could be preserved long enough to last them until the next time they had access to the oven if you lived in a community uh, where you had access to you know, a flat top stove, you might be able to make a flat bread, you know, similar to what we think of as lefsa here in Minnesota, um, but you might make it with a rye or barley flour rather than a white flour and a potato. Um, it really, again, if you live way up north, maybe only oats screw where you were, so your bread's going to be oat based. Then uh, the further south you went, you might have access to a rye or even a wheat flour, and then you would have a softer bread as a result of having access to those uh, flours. Fascinating topic. One of my favorite. I love talking about the uh, bread map. It's really cool. So check it out. Thanks. Um, I, that's a great hint. We'll try to find that and put that up in the chat before we go. Um, uh, Krista mentioned the new Scandinavian cooking show on TPT that we all love. And um, what I'm going to do is say thank you to Patrice Johnson and thank you all for being here. Again, check out our website for more programs. Check out Patrice's books, either at Subtext or another bookstore. And um, I'm going to stop the recording. But again, thank you all for being here. We hope to see you again soon and another History Revealed program. And I wanna say thank you to Peter Ratcliffe of the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library for their sponsorship of these programs.